marketing and education and any kind of uh, initiative with our customers. And um, this webinar was kind of uh, a last minute idea because Tom graciously agreed to go live with us for an hour. Tom and I, uh, for, for those, Tom will introduce himself, but Tom is the Director of Performance and Innovation at Yale University. Tom and I have spent a lot of time together on the phone uh, just talking over team builder as well as many other things. I even had the pleasure of going up to Yale and spending an entire day with their strength and conditioning department, which is fantastic. Um, as I've noted before, I speak to a lot of strength coaches on a daily basis. And, you know, th this is not to, to take away from anyone else, but um, every time I speak to Tom, I feel like some of his thoughts and his uh, practices at his program are really, really impactful. And I think they're really important to the field of strength and conditioning. Um, and I think that there are just some very fundamental truths uh, that could be reiterated to the community. And that's why I kind of reached out to Tom and said, hey, you know, maybe a webinar could be the, the best thing we can do here to kind of share some of these ideas. And of course, since Tom is a big believer and a practitioner and using software and digital tools, including Team Builder, I thought, hey, we might as well just integrate this into making it a very contemporary presentation. So um, here we are, uh, folks are still trickling in, but this webinar is being recorded. Um, so anyone, if you wanna see this again, we'll have a copy sent out. So don't worry about, you know, kind of missing tidbits if anything happens, uh, it is being recorded. So with that being said, it's 12.02, let's go ahead and get started. Tom, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for uh, taking time uh, to do this and thanks for uh, putting time and effort into your presentation. Everyone looks forward to it. So the floor is yours. Awesome. I appreciate it. And again, to thank you guys for taking the time out of your day. And again, I know everybody got back to uh, to uh, school pretty uh, pretty recently here, either this week or they'll be going back soon next week. And as you had mentioned, again, um, we at Yale use a lot of technology. And again, we try to do the best for our students. And, and I think today, again, isn't about just saying that we have all the answers, but kind of maybe give some insights maybe one or two nuggets that can kind of help you uh, do your job a little bit better, help your athletes a little bit more. Um, and if not, we can certainly circle back um, afterwards. But again, it's just an exciting time to kind of talk about some of these things and some of the insights and aha moments that we've had uh, in our time in New Haven. So what I'm going to do is just kind of click through. And again, with this, uh, I don't want it just to be me talking for uh, the entire hour. So I know Hewitt's got uh, some polls and some questions that he'll shoot out to you guys. And again, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any of those and stop and take the time. And then at the end, we'll have some Q&A. So again, I want to make it worth your while. So without further ado, I'll kind of jump in. Again, my background, um, I was hired at Yale in 2016 to head up the, um, the training for the men's lacrosse program uh, and then the football team. And we did that. And then as of uh, 2018, uh, I was appointed the director of performance and innovation um, at Yale and oversee all teams. So, and again, we have 800 plus athletes, roughly five coaches um, and, and some interns but we have to really kind of manage this huge problem of how do we give the best programs possible with, you know, such a high, uh, high demand. So such a high force. And I think this speaks to volumes to many people where, you know, it might be one on 400, it might be in the room, you might be one on 50. And so how, how do we work with that? How do we connect with athletes from all over the world? And then how do we make sure that, you know, we're doing the best that we can. And again, for us, you know, we've had some pretty good success with the lacrosse program, with our football program and countless others, you know, tennis, basketball, basketball is everything, um, but we're always trying to strive to do more. And I think that you'll see that as a common theme is that we're never going to quite have all the answers, but we know that there is a truth out there and we want to try to push further and further uh, towards getting closer and closer to that kind of optimal program. So when, when you guys signed up for this webinar, and again, I wanted to be clear um, because again, we can get very, very, very technical. And I, and I know we have a wide range of people from all over, um, but really this, this webinar is really designed um, for the coach that is looking to try to improve their player development. And if you've got something good that's working right now, awesome. Uh, if you're looking for a little bit more, uh, maybe we can find something today. This, this webinar is really designed for someone who maybe is understaffed or again, those high force numbers. So one on 50, one on 400 or whatever. Um, and then coaches with limited resources. Cause again, I think, you know, at every level you have to be smart. What am I going to spend my money on? Am I going to spend it on barbells? Am I going to spend it on software? Am I going to spend it on who knows what, uh, you know, and again, we're lucky enough at school, we've got access to some incredible technology at the med school and GPS and all these kind of things. But again, if you're, if you're listening to this, you have to kind of think about, 
okay, dollar for dollar, minute for minute, what can I do um, to do the most for my program? And, and realizing that what you do in year one may not be what you do in year two. As your culture changes, as your coaches changes, um, that may evolve and that, that's fine too. So really developing a roadmap for you as a coach in a department as much as the players themselves. And then lastly, this is designed for coaches looking to get a competitive advantage. Um, again, I'm so lucky every day I get to go to work with some of the you know, brightest minds in the world, uh, our office in particular, we've got coaches with, you know, a wide background of, uh, experiences, both personally and professionally, and they really push us. So our environment at Yale really, you know, makes me think outside the box. We talk about every day we go to work and we're learning something new. And I think for us, the more that we realize and we learn, we realize we don't know. And so, again, if you're a competitive coach, most coaches were former athletes. You don't like losing. You don't want your program to lose. You know, you're trying to figure out what you can do to help. And then lastly, when you finish this webinar, hopefully if I did my job, you know, you have a better understanding how to make the digital environment work for you. And I think across the board, sometimes digital can be very intimidating to coaches, especially if you don't know how to program or maybe you're not good in Excel or maybe you're not good. Just kind of the, the web platform in general can be really intimidating. Hopefully I can give you kind of some insights that you're going to see a lot of the digital stuff is just it's a digital manifestation of what we've been doing for years, which is, you know, classical training. Um, one thing that I know, and I, I spoke to Hewitt about, I think that we do really well, um, and, and a lot of it's a credit to the software, is the auto-regulation. So when people come to Yale, if you notice this little, those little pie charts up there, um, individual athletes, every athlete that comes to Yale is on a different plan. And people say, how do you have time to do that? How do you have time to you know, scale things up and do that with such a limited staff? And we'll talk about that. But really, that's where the beauty of technology allows one coach to do individualization um, across the board. And then lastly, use visualizations to kind of talk about your change, to talk about the things that you're doing so that when you walk into a meeting with a sport coach or you walk into a meeting with an administrator, you can clearly demonstrate, you know, things are working, things are not working, and you know, what the things you're gonna do to implement or maybe continue to do. Um, and I think the last thing is that all of this is a moving target. You know, again, I've never seen a program just, you know, programs either die uh, or they evolve and usually nowhere in between. And, and obviously your data and your results are going to speak for themselves. And that's what I hope that when you finish here today, you at least are pointed in the right direction, if not maybe down the road of thinking about new things that you can implement um, with your group. So without further ado, let's talk about some key concepts that you kind of have to believe in um, in order to, to make sense of this stuff. You know, when you talk about writing a plan, and I, and I talk to our coaches about this all the time, when you write a plan, there has to be an anticipated biological change. And so by that, I mean, hey, you're running a speed plan. You should probably test their speed before and then test your speed after. If you're going to do muscle, you know, maybe it's a DEXA, maybe it's a skin caliper, maybe, maybe it's a scale, maybe it's pictures, whatever it is, there's got to be some sort of thing that you do. So again, if strength goes up by 30%, that's really great. Well, what if that's 30% over their entire, you know, four years? Well, that's less optimal. And so what can I do to speed it up? And you can get as crazy as you want of, you know, auditing your block, auditing your year, auditing your week or your day, um, or down to the sets and reps and the actual working sets. And so again, having clarity of what am I actually trying to do? And not just a little bit of everything. You know, if you think about from a cooking standpoint, you don't just throw everything in the bowl at once. When you build a house, you don't put the sofa in before the drywall and all of these things. So the sequence and order that you do things can either be synergistic or they can work against you. And so figuring out, you know, what that looks like uh, is critical. So again, you have to have an anticipated change that you're trying to do and then evaluate yourself. And I think sometimes coaches say, you know, oh man, I don't want to look bad in front of my coach or, you know, I don't want to look bad in front of my staff. Well, you're going to write bad programs. It happens. It's okay. And again, hopefully you only write them once. You know, that was one of the greatest quotes that uh, Boyd Epley gave me early on is that you are going to write bad programs. And I think that once you can accept that, then you can move on to writing really good programs. And you'll see that, you know, that documentation and saving uh, is really, really important in, in moving forward and designing better and better plans. Next. When we talk about designing a plan, a lot of people talk about, oh, I want the biggest bench, the highest vertical jump, this, that, the other thing. And, and again, you know, I, I kind of laugh is that if you think about when you go to the hospital, you go to the emergency room, they're not trying to make you optimal. They're trying to keep you from dying. You know, they've identified the thing that's going to kill you first. They've identified the major problem that you have. And so we joke about, you know, when you get a freshman or you get someone who first starts working with you, they've got some disease. What is it? You know, they've got weak itis. They're slow itis, out of shape itis, whatever you want to itis you call. 
and then you have to put them on a plan to cure them. And so specifically on strength, that might take quite a while. That might take months and months, if not years. Um, maybe if they have mobility problems, then you can fix that in a couple of weeks, you know, from a conditioning standpoint, six to eight weeks, all these different things, body comp, nutrition, all those things. But you have a start point, you have an end point, and then you have all those little milestones and checkpoints along the way to make sure that, you know, you're headed in the right direction. Remembering that success isn't linear. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. And especially if you're working with a population uh, and a teenage population, they're teenagers. And sometimes you have to wait for them and you can't rush that process. But if you don't have a roadmap for success and you don't have intended outcomes, it becomes very hard to control and anticipate when you're going to have those successes. Next, and I mentioned this earlier. I don't claim to have all the answers and I don't think that there's such things as a bad workout. The only bad workouts are ones that were, you know, to the point where someone gets injured. But again, there's degrees of optimal. And I think you have to be constantly searching for that. If you write a really great classical program that gives you consistently week over week, two to 3% increase in strength, then that's awesome. Build off that. But if you get a program that, you know, say somebody gains five pounds, you know, of muscle in two years, well, maybe you could go back and revisit that. Maybe you can find a program that puts on six or seven pounds or contextually it's, you know, better for freshmen than juniors or seniors or whatever. But there is an optimal workout out there. And again, too, with, I think, uh, uh, Bill Kramer and Steve Fleck in one of their books talked about there's 10 to the 65th power of potential combinations of rep set schemes and different workouts that you can do, um, which is incredible. It's infinite. And again, it's rotating and it's daily, you know, based on how the kids feel and all of that. So again, there is an optimal workout that exists and we have to kind of navigate our way through science and common sense and culture to figure out what is best for that individual at that time. And then lastly, to all of this stuff, you, you have to be, if you're, if you're interested in this, you have to be a coach who's committed to trying to find that. If you just want to slap up a workout on a whiteboard, if you just want to post something up on the wall or hand out a piece of paper, um, again, it's, it's not bad. It's not the end of the world. But again, too, you have to realize is that, you know, it's going to work sometimes and it's going to not work a bunch of the other times. And we always talk about as well, you know, we all agree that wearing shoes is good. Shoes are great. You know, if you don't wear shoes and you go outside, you're going to step on things, you're going to hurt your feet, you know, but that doesn't mean everybody should wear a size 12 shoe. So really finding that fit. And again, too, depending on how deep you want to drill down, you know, you have some fundamental GPP um, concepts that you can work through, but as you go higher and higher and those gains become harder and harder to chase, how much as a coach are you willing to drill in um, to get that advantage and find what that athlete needs? And again, it could be something as simple as just nailing nutrition. We have athletes at, uh, at our school that, you know, just getting nutrition squared away is one of the greatest um, things that we can do. And that reduces their inflammation. That gives them more energy. They're able to build. Uh, they're genetically gifted. And so then they take off. But if you don't hit those fundamental key points early on, um, it's never going to work. And again, remember player development as we know it right now is in its infancy. You go back 10 years ago, we didn't have digital platforms. You go back 20 years ago, you know, we didn't have the ability right now where I can go and get a hormone profile. I can go and get a DEXA scan. I can go and use a force plate. Force plates used to be, you know, restricted to just, you know, the research institutes. And now, you know, there's companies for a couple of grand, you can bring it right in there and you can take a look at every action moment and potential and video and, and it's wild. So it's evolving. And I think it's just important to make sure that, you know, as we have these new tools in the toolbox, uh, we don't stray away from some of the basic, you know, hammer and nails that we know that have stood the test of time. Training as we know it has been around for thousands of years. Um, the technology and the different things that we add to it should give us clarity, uh, not muddy the waters, uh, if you will. So, um, Let's take a look. Are we the only industry like this? And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, no, emergency rooms and medicine has this all the time. We have a start point and we need to make an assessment. And again, I encourage you, if you don't have this, uh, to sit down with your staff and think this through. So this is a great example. Somebody comes in, they arrive at the emergency room. What are we going to do? Are we going to register them? Okay, we get them reviewed, see by a doctor. And does this patient need to stay? This is very similar to when you maybe you get a freshman and the first thing you say is, can you touch your toes? Can you do an overhead squat? And maybe you use an FMS screen, maybe you use something more comprehensive, Fusionetics, whatever it is. There's some sort of assessment. And then maybe you, you know, move that into lifting. You know, can they lift? Do they know the difference between a barbell and a dumbbell? But there's this flow and this happens. And again, too, I think when the thing that's really interesting to see is this is the way my brain works. But if you go look at any of the old time coaches that have been around, they're doing this already. 
they're patterning. We are pattern recognition uh, um, being where we look at things and we know, okay, if you can't do this, then you can't do that. So these if then statements exist in coaching all the time. And again, if you're one of the people looking at this and again, you kind of, you know, a little bit intimidated by the technology, realize you're doing this anyway. This is already happening uh, across the board. Um, and just this will help kind of extend you to, you know, you know, bridge that gap between your staff to make sure that you're all thinking on the same page. Because again, oftentimes when you get a young coach, uh, their flow chart may look very different. And again, I don't think there's a right or wrong. And I think the best coaches have these super comprehensive, super deep uh, dive charts uh, that are just really effective. But how can we build that out? And how can we build that process out? Because if we don't have this, the next slide becomes very hard. And, and that next slide that we're going to talk about is, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? Again, if I don't have a flow chart of what I'm going to assess, again, if I'm not, if I'm not going to assess their mobility right off the bat, but strength's my key goal, we all know you're going to eventually get roofed by your joint mobility. Again, if I can't train it, then I can't make it better. So thinking about what am I trying to accomplish? So if I go in here and then the coach says to me, I want to get them strong. Awesome. We all agree. I think if you're on this call, you agree, you can make people strong. But the coach says, I need them to squat 500 pounds, you know, in a month. All right, cool because the kid right now squats 200 pounds and it's questionable at depth that don't sign up for that. And again, too, you know that because you've looked at your chart and you know how long it takes to be able to do these things. You have to set realistic expectations and realize, you know, often it's the relationship that you have with the head coach or the sport coach, or if you're dealing in the private sector with clients and parents, we have to understand what we're working with and set realistic expectations because there's nothing worse than when you say, Oh yeah, I can do that. I can do that. But then just biologically, we know that that's not possible. And so you have to set a confidence. And again, are you going to have 100% confidence? No. If the head coach comes in and says, we need to get faster, you better come up with a plan to make them faster. But again, I've had times and, you know, whether it's here at Yale or other places where people say, you know, I need to lose 20 pounds. Okay. How long? In a week. All right, cool. You know, I suggest amputation because there's no way you can confidently do that safely with somebody. And that's just an unrealistic goal. But again, working with degrees and parameters of what you think the likelihood that you can accomplish that goal is so important because you have to take into account, you know, right now, do we have a culture problem and people are missing lifts? You might be able to get somebody strong, but if you have 30% attendance, that's going to directly inter uh, interfere with that. You know, same thing we talk about social things. Again, we're dealing with people. We're not dealing with robots. So, you know, you can be a scientific white paper as you want, but if you deal with the collegiate environment or the high school environment, you realize you're, you're dealing with a population that has social, you know, distractions and all sorts of things. And so culture might be one of the most important things. And that marrying of the subjective and the objective stuff together is what really you know, is important. And so when you, you do this assessment and you've got your flow and now you say, okay, cool. First thing we're going to work on is we're going to show up. That's a new adaptation. We're going to do strength. We're going to do muscle and you layer them out. And sometimes it could be five things. Sometimes it could be 10 things. And, and what I encourage a lot of our, our coaches is pick a few things and do it really, really well. They talk about the keeping it simple all the time. That that's one of the main things. If you can people show up and they have mobility and they're strong, you know, just that old, old school strength is, is really valuable. That's going to make a big difference. And again, if you start adding too many goals, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Well, oftentimes you see those programs don't add up um, to, to really very much anything. And I'm going to show you why. And, and again, too, and I've talked about this um, before at Yale with our interns, but then also too, and I think it's important we take a step back. We're, we're not unique. This is common in every single industry. And, and there's a mathematical problem called the traveling salesman problem. And so if you think of each and every goal, as we just mentioned before, strength, power, speed, those are destinations. You know, when you come in, you should be able to touch your toes. That is not a major, you know, uh, you know, hard thing to do. But nonetheless, if you can't do that, you know, it's probably gonna be hard for you to do the other mobility things, which leads to squats, which leads to cleans or whatever you're trying to accomplish. But you have to get from point A to point B. And what you see very quickly is that in the traveling salesman problem, as you start adding destinations, the combinations start to skyrocket. It's exponential. And I think that's what's so important to realize is the goal, the path we're trying to make. And if everybody can see here, we've got these seven different destinations. You're trying to get from point A to point B in the fewest distance possible. And we want to minimize the total distance. And this goes on in transportation. This goes on in all sorts of um, types of industries, but this point A to point B phenomena. And I think for us, what's really important is that, you know, we have to get from one to two to three to four 
but they could, you know, that could change, that could move. If we were talking about cities, you know, we need to go Boston, Chicago, LA. Well, you know, as things change and kids move, maybe they move positions. Maybe they were really, really close to being at their body weight goal, you know, at linebacker, but they get kicked down to the end. Well, now, now we got to move. So now the target moves. So we have to reassess where we're at and prioritize. What are we going to do for that next step? And if you can see on the bottom there, the A, B, C, D, E, there's different paths. And I think this is when I got back, I said to you guys earlier, is that I don't think that there's any one right way. Anytime you're dealing with a multivariable problem, there's lots of different combinations you can take. There's lots of different paths. But the thing about collegiate athletics and high school athletics and any athletics is that it's a, it's a race. It is a race. And this race right now, if I look at, you know, say these are, you know, two teams, well, the optimal guys, the A, B, C, D, E, they're going to win. They achieved their objectives. They got their strengths faster. And again, too, if you think of this symbolically as just one player, you know, on the sport of football, you might have 115 of these. So it's my 115 versus your 115. And each of those players has five different destinations. So it can get really, really complex quickly. And that's why I mentioned on the slide before, really stay focused, assess where you're at, and then make realistic expectations for what you're trying to achieve. Because what the worst thing that happened is, is that Again, you, you said you were going to try to hit all these different things and you only end up hitting one or two. So really prioritize what you want to do. And then this is common across uh, everything is that, you know, early on it used to be, oh, I'm going to follow what he did. And so we see some of that with a little tribe culture. You know, I'm a West Side guy. I'm a starting strength guy. I'm a triphasic guy. I'm a guy, I'm a guy, I'm a guy or a female, you know, and you follow what other people did. And that's fine. You know, that, that's been around, you know, people going from island to island, you know, in the ocean, they would follow the roots of their ancestors in boats, and then they use stars, you know, and that was helpful in case if you got lost or confused. And then that evolved to maps and compasses and so land nav, and we see that now. And, you know, I think if you look at the early 90s, everybody used MapQuest, that was pretty cool, except for when the roads were shut down and the route didn't work and you got lost again. And now we have ways, so individual GPS, and we're using, you know, a community to be able to understand roadblocks and traffic and all other different patterns. So that's, that's better. And then if you look at any of the global fleets for logistics, for shipping and, you know, FedEx and distribution, it's all interconnected, but all of them come down to the same, answering the same problem, which is this traveling salesman of how do I get things done quickly and efficiently in the most optimal route possible? And that's what I want you to think about. And I think that specifically digital um, you know, training is that you're allowed to be able to see so many different touch points that otherwise would be thousands and thousands of pieces of paper um, across your training platform. And that makes it very difficult. So what I want to do is just kind of go in here. And again, too, if there's any uh, questions that people have, uh, you can just fire them over to Hewitt and we'll get into them. But I really want to talk about, you know, oftentimes I get questions, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about HRV? What do you think about power output? What do you think about questionnaire? All these different things. And, you know, it comes into subjective and, you know, objective um, questions um, about, you know, what's the state of my athlete? And so when we get that, um, it's important not to get distracted by the fact that like they're going to have to play. I think sometimes we want to make everybody into a test tube and be perfect, but they're not. Competition is going to happen with fatigue. You know, you're going to have to go in and perform maybe at 6 a.m. and it's not ideal, but it doesn't mean we scrap everything. Because again, if every single day, you know, if I'm in season and we say, okay, you know, hey, he can't lift because, you know, his HRV is off or he can't lift because, you know, they're sore. Well, if we keep doing that every single week, they're eventually going to get hurt because they need the strength stimulus. And I think that's a, that's a larger, that's a larger conversation that you have to have the coach is say, hey, how come this kid every single time they're coming in and they're buried? Do we need to alter things in practice? And you have to be really careful with that too, because if you start telling sport coaches how to run their practices, that's a very slippery slope. But I think we all need to just keep in mind is we're just not that fragile. I think at the end of the day, you know, you can pretty safely say people can do strength plans, some form, some variation, some RPE. And if they can't do a strength plan, if you don't feel comfortable with that, I feel pretty confident that pretty much every day you can do a mobility plan because Again, I, I've yet to see an athlete that, you know, every single day you, they come in and they have perfect mobility. So you can do that or even just a regen day. So every day you kind of got these three basic pillars that you can touch upon, but how you do it, when you do it, all of that stuff's um, really predicated by, you know, what you're using to make those decisions. But I, I don't think people need to get hung up as much as they do right now. It's really cool and sexy to have all this, you know, technology, but I think some of the greatest technology is just common sense. You know, common sense is probably the most, you know, undervalued data point right now. You know, I, I, I'm sorry if I go in on a force plate or if I go in on, you know, 
their HRV is perfect, but you know, we're two days out from a national championship and the kids, you know, doesn't look right. When I look them in the eyes, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell the head coach. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're do this plan. You have to use common sense. And I think that's really when we talk about the programming, having flexibility in your programming is an incredibly powerful tool um, to be able to, to, to navigate through that. So what I want to do is just take a break real quick. Cause again, just been kind of talking, I want to show some people um, the environment that we use and just kind of some of the things that we can do to tackle this. So again, say we're looking at strength, we're looking at strength, body weight ratio, any of these different things that we want to do. Um, we can do this a couple different ways and we can skin this um, in the program a couple uh, with a couple different scenarios. So I'm going to switch here, bring this over here. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, let's talk about player one. So player one uh, is in here and he's got a couple different things. And so just for everybody, and again, too, I know we have some people that use team builders, some people that don't. Um, when we come in here, we have these different exercises. Within an exercise, we've got this box. And just again, from a programming standpoint, this would be your Excel rows and columns of reps and sets. And we can do a couple different things. We can pull from a list and inventory of workouts, I'm sorry, exercises. We can go sets. We can go reps or time. We can do custom. So you'll notice here, I'll show you real quick. Say I wanna go in and just do five reps. Okay, well, every set, set one, two, three, four, uh, are set at 85% and we're gonna do five reps. But say maybe I wanna do pyramids and I wanna come in here and I wanna say, yeah, I'm gonna go three, two, one, one, whatever it is, I, I can mix and match. And if you notice before there, I put three to five, so I can even put zones. And I think at least for us, just anecdotally, it's been really helpful, especially with your stronger athletes that are maybe moving more significant load. It's better to give them kind of a range. And again, yeah, hit five if you feel good. But at the end of the day, if, if you get to three and technique starts to fall off, I, I could care less whether it's three, three reps or four reps. I want you to be um, safe. And we're really more targeting certain zones and tissues and, and nervous system pathways than really trying to have just chase a number of hitting five. If you hit four really awesome reps, that's fantastic. And so we can skin it that way. And so these expand and these contract. And, and this is an example, and we've done this, is that say we're gonna come in and again, it's a strength workout. Maybe I want my seniors that have a little bit more load and a little bit more uh, accomplishment with their technique, I'm gonna give them the freedom to be within this zone. And why this is important too, is if they come in and it's three to five and the kid finishes five reps and says, I can do 10 more, well, then we also really know I'm not really at 85% because of uh, the tables. And we know that, you know, okay, well, if I'm really trying to target strength, I mean, I might need to go in and um, attack some of these other sets uh, with a different value. Next, and again, too, we talk about this all the time. You kind of have these open sets, uh, uh, as many reps as possible. If you feel confident with that, hey, come on in. We're going to go 85% and we're just going to judge you for the day. And whatever you get um, for that number of that value that's going to then um, set the remaining set. So this would be a little bit more aggressive approach than if you um, put it on the back end. So the set has already occurred and then we're just trying to double check our work to make sure that, yeah, no, in fact, um, those numbers were correct. And then lastly, with a freshman, you might come in and just say, hey, we're going to go straight linear. So on this exercise, I don't need you chasing percentages. I don't need you chasing speeds. Let's just see you get really, really good 100 pounds. And next time we're going to do 110. And so you can see already just tackling the concept of strength. We've got a lot more flexibility rather than just handing them a piece of paper and saying, all right, we're all doing three sets of five or four sets of five. So this is not only going to allow for uh, better quality of training, but it's also going to allow for us to be able to really fine tune and tweak it. And again, the presentation is completely customizable. If I want to go in and say all my squats are here, or if I want to move them around, I can do all these different things. So it's uh, it's really up to you. And I think another thing too, as we talked about before, say you're a little bit intimidated um, by technology, just keep it really simple. Sometimes at Yale, we'll walk in and we'll say, okay, for our starters, we're going to have very low RPE um, type training sets. And then some of our developmental players, we're going to be a little bit more aggressive because we know they're not playing this weekend. And this is across all of the sports, but you can mix and match as many as you want. You might have three or four different options for you as the coach uh, at the rack to be able to make the decision. And again, you can mix and match it any single way that you want. Again, here it is again, just kind of individually highlighted. So again, that's one of the things that we really enjoy is being able to have that freedom and flexibility to use different strategies and approaches um, for tackling that problem.
Hey, Tom, quick question for you. Um, this is from a high school coach, Coach Robert Kirkland. Um, he asked, where do you think your incoming freshmen at Yale, where, where are they most deficient when you analyze them? Uh, uh, so we at Yale, we have one of the, the most selective admissions uh, in the country, and, and we have really smart guys. Um, but when we talk about deficiency, uh, sometimes it's not physical. So I've asked, you know, our, some of our guys, I said, okay, you know, you know, do you eat, you know, do you eat vegetables? Do you have a good diet? Yeah, I have a good diet. You eat vegetables? Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah, I eat rice. So that might be where you start. And it might be where it's a mobility thing. And again, we, with all the different sports we have, hyper-technical sports, like say squash or fencing, you know, it might be fundamental. Like this is a barbell. This is a sliding set. This is a, you know, this is kilograms. This is pounds and really getting them into the culture to some of our football players are pretty gifted. We might have an athlete walk in with a 37 inch vertical right off the bat, but you know, they've been, they're very elastic and they've been gifted their entire life. We put everybody through the same kind of assessment of kind of, okay, mentally, first and foremost, mentally, where are they at? Are they going to respect the weight room? And then usually we tackle mobility. Then we talk about the strength and strength and culture and understanding what it, what is strong. You know, is it, is it squatting? Is it squatting double body weight? Is it squatting your body weight at a meter per second? Is it your single leg strength and all that? And so for us, it's really, everybody goes through that same kind of start with movement and build up. <clears throat> but I think even before that, it's really trying to tackle, do they even understand the weight room or are they going to walk in and say, okay, you know, I saw this on Instagram. I want to do this now you know, in your safety and your policy, and especially in the high school realm, it's so important that you're setting the parameters for what does it mean to be a committed and intentional athlete? And that's a word that, you know, we say all the time is you need to be intentional. Yes, you showed up. Yes, you're strong, but you're not intentional. And those little details are things that carry over to the on the field. Did you clean up the weight room? The best teams that we have at Yale are the ones that clean up everything. They mop the floor, they put away the plates, they square everything away because they take pride in their room. And so, I think really start with that kind of subjective stuff um, and make sure that their mind is right and then work for mobility to strength, to power, to speed. Um, and especially at the high school level, it's going to be a lot of strength. It's going to be a lot of mobility, especially if they're growing, if you're dealing with taller athletes, get that stuff right. Because if that foundation's cracked from the start, then you're, you're going to run into a whole bunch of problems as the force demands and power demands start to skyrocket. So hopefully that, that made sense. So but great question. Any others on that to it? No, that's it for now. Awesome. So <clears throat> we talked about, and I just showed you um, those rep, scheme, uh, rep schemes and ranges. Um, again, what's your risk reward profile look like? In traditional block planning, again, somebody might test in, in January, you kind of know what their max is, and then you're using percentages off that. And remember, percentages, a lot of that came off of powerlifting, a lot of that came off of, off of Olympic lifting, um, where there's, you know, very specific movements. And so that's why I laugh when, you know, somebody can squat a bunch of weight, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that their lunge is going to be a direct correlation. We know that their strength deficits and there's approximate, you know, if you can do this, then you should be able to do, you know, a back squat, you know, 40% is the lunge uh, of the back squat. Well, not necessarily, because as you start getting into more complex movements, multiple planes, they can start to fall off. And so just being really smart that you don't try to take a really good concept like percentages um, and then let that run out for the entire semester. Because again, I've had people come up and say, you know, it's really great. You know, we hit 90% of our max for 10 reps today. That's pretty awesome. It's like, coach, you, you can't you know, that that's, yes, you, you took percentages and then, you know, we, we kind of got lost there a little bit that those uh, percentages are finite. So if you told me 90%, as you start creeping over four reps, you know, I'm going to start to have concerns, especially if you say it's 10 or 12, um, you know, daily undulating, there's some really, really good positive, you know, research that shows that we've used it, um, you know, but it might be the point is that if you do that with a freshman in high school, it's completely over their head. I'll tell you right now, I think one of the greatest things you can do as a strength coach is give wins. You might have an athlete that's maybe not playing a lot or maybe confidence and self-esteem is a, you know, an issue. A confident athlete, a strong athlete, you know, male or female is going to be a better athlete. And so if they go in and they're like, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, guess I'm doing a heavy day. I'm doing a light day. I'm this, but they don't get it. You can just keep it to be more linear. You can keep it to be something where they can go, and, wow, I got stronger today. Because again, we see this all the time. Uh, and again, particularly in females, <clears throat> nobody can squat 135. Nobody can squat 135. The big, the big plates are really scary, intimidating. One person does it and then 10 people magically got stronger. Nobody can squat 200, 225 magically. And then I tell them all the time. And, and for the guys, the same thing is it, it, you didn't biologically get that much stronger. 
your mind is so powerful and what your performance outcome is going to be that if your mind isn't, you know, focused and confident, you're just not going to do it. And again, too, this is where, you know, if you get into intercept undulating, so if it's a, say a six, four, two, two, four, six pyramid and you go in, okay, do your six. All right, great. You could have done a bunch more. We're going to up your max. Okay. And then when you come down the backside of the pyramid, now you've got neurological fatigue. Okay. We're going to, we're going to drop you down. Look at the total tonnage, compare my pounds per rep. All right. All that stuff's great. You just might not have the bandwidth. You might not have the coaches. And again, too, it might not be appropriate. So again, this whole right versus wrong or the, this way to train, I think so much of training in any program is so contextual into what is the current state? What is the context? What's the buy-in of your parents? What's the buy-in of your coaches to make sure that what you're doing breeds confidence? And if you're a strength coach and you know you get to every Friday, you should do it, you should do a reflection. You know, is my program going in the right direction? Am I getting the results that I wanted that I set out? And so for us, we'll do a big review in January. We do a big review in May, a big review in August, and really kind of, you know, have an honest, hard conversation with ourselves. Is what we're doing overkill or is it just right? And again, too, anticipating what we might need to do in the future. And again, all of this stuff is so complex. And again, I, I can, you know, dive so deep into the programming, um, you know, concepts that, you know, are you still re really worried about your HRV? Because, you know, you realize that you're not squared away. You're, you have guys doing, you know, 85% of their max for 12 reps. You know, again, maybe we need to focus in on that. I think one of the most powerful data tools, and we're doing this actually today, um, where we're doing a retro uh, look back of the entire 2019 season in our strength plans, did we actually hit the numbers uh, that we thought we were doing? And so if you're listening to this and I said to you, hey, go pull four years on this player. You know, I could, pull, I could pull any player at Yale and look at every single rep and set they've ever done. That's immensely powerful so that, you know, you realize what works and, you know, what also what doesn't work. So again, kind of philosophically, I hope this all makes sense for everybody is that you want to have the flexibility, but also not go so crazy uh, that you lose sight of what the original goal was. Next, we'll talk about this. And, and this is something that's really, you know, when I have people come visit and they come talk to you know, how do you handle this? How do you do the individualization stuff? Well, you know, we've got a larger plan and we talk about what each team wants to do. And depending on the team, we'll break it by position, break it by goal, break it by all different things. And we make our little flow chart, but then, you know, you get these sudden changes, you know, and I've never seen a program when people say, oh, today's a heavy day. Well, you know, if you're a heavy day in college on a Thursday, you know, you might get there or say it's Friday morning you might not be able to do what you originally anticipated. So how do you flex out? I think that's one of the things that, you know, we've done a really good job at is looking and say, okay, what are the consistent things that we're seeing day in and day out, week in and week out that are, in, that are interference problems and how do we make changes? And so if they come in and it's an off season of a hundred workouts say, and they're missing 20 of them, well, four times a week for a month is 16. Okay, great. You just lost a month of training for various reasons. Well, what can you do? And then how are you treating your starters from your non-starters? And is that in a larger part of a three-year plan? What are my goals and expectations that I'm trying to do? And again, I don't want anybody to get hurt, but I think at the end of the day, you know, if you don't train, if you, you know, give them an out or say, Hey, you're just going to sit this out. I think you're not doing them any service either because they're just going to get hurt in the field of competition. And I've never met anybody who doesn't benefit from being strong or mobile or, you know, hopefully both. So in this scenario, as we talk about this, you know, say we're overseeing a tennis team and it's a great player and we're in season and, you know, now they've got a lower body injury. You know, I ask coach all the time, what would you do if somebody walked in? It was supposed to be a big, heavy power day. And, you know, now they've rolled their ankle. Typically the answer is, you know, what can you do? You know, do what you can. Okay. So stay away from that stuff. But again, that plan that you originally wrote was under the understanding that it was a power day. And so specifically in the case of an ankle, what kind of wishy-washy, you know, training stimulus is that going to be for that day? Or do you tell them to go ride the bike? Does it become a conditioning day? You know, I know when I got to Yale, you know, people say, oh, you know, I got a shoulder problem. I'll see you, you know, next season. I go, what do you mean? We're going to put you on lowers. What's lowers? You know, you're going to go on a lower body development plan, which is all encompassing. And then you'll go into a modified plan, you know, and then as you come online and you're fully integrated back into the team, we're going to do that. But we've got a lot of ground to cover. You know, we just don't have enough time. So there should never be a day where somebody comes in. There's not a planned training stimulus to try to get an effect. And, you know, maybe they're going to be, you know, out for a couple of days. So say in an ankle could be two or three workouts, or it could just be that day. Maybe they're going to leave and they're going to come back in two weeks because they're going to go on break. And when they come back, they'll be fine. But how do you deal with that one day change? And again, I put here just examples of some of the things that we write out ahead of time. So what's an uppers lower RPE? So, you know, it's an upper body. We're going to pull, we're going to push, 
And again, depending on the sport, you can get as creative as you want, but you know, it's a single day or, you know, it's an upper strength plan, upper power plan, upper long-term, all those different things. Those are calendars. And so just for everybody, again, if you're not familiar, calendars are what we would consider our blocks or phases. So this would be the, the mesocycles, if you will. Um, even maybe if you want to do a, a macro cycle, when you go and you think about, okay, this is the six week, eight week, 12 week type larger plan, those would be calendars. But then the individual day, uh, the loadouts for the days, um, those are just single efforts. So I'll just show you just, and again, too, just taking a break here real quick, flipping into how we would do that. We would go in and say, okay, um, let's go to player two. Player two is our tennis player. All righty. You know, here we are. We're on uh, today. I'm supposed to come in. Oh, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I'm, um, you know, I've got my ankle injury. Well, all right, cool. No problem. And we'll do this and just operationally, just so everyone understands, we'll typically dedicate one coach um, during the lift because we'll have multiple people on the floor, say two or three people. One person will be the modifier of programs, if you will, um, to do this. So I'll say, okay, go over, speak to coach, uh, whoever. And then we pull up this person's thing. And so this is individually, I can just go in and load out and say, okay, uh, let's put you on an uppers plan uh, for single day. All right, one day, we're going to go in, I'm going to replace the current workouts. So I don't want them to do that. And so now we go in, and now we've changed. So suddenly that athlete that was going to come in and just ride the bike or you know, mix and match a few things. We've got these preloaded kind of basic. And again, for today's uh, presentation, I just, you know, four by five, but it could be three by five. It could be whatever you want. But the point is, is that they're going to be able to walk away. And we're going to say, yeah, you know what, for a tennis player, we wanted them to get some extra pulling. So they're going to get some uh, extra work in here. Um, and it pushes them closer towards their strength goal. And, and, and we're going to be fine, which is much better than just sitting on a box or sitting out of a program. So that was just a simple um, loadout. But I want to show another thing is that if we come in here and we say, okay, you know what, player two, you know, you, it looks like you're going to be out for a while. Um, let, let's go in and just, uh, let's put you on a different plan. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to manage this user and I'm going to say, okay, there you are, player two, tennis power plan. Well, I need to switch you to the, to the long-term, you know, uppers. So this is going to be a much more, you know, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks. This is going to be a much longer thing. We're going to start you on that uh, today as well. Um, and then I'm just going to, I'm going to put you right there. So now when I go back to that same person, so when we pull up the calendar, um, this person's now on a more immediate track, um, for what their appropriate goals are. So again, you'll see here, we put in some of this stuff. Um, oh, sorry, we have the lap pull down and then we have the abs and then some mobility work. So again, just with a couple clicks, I'm able to go in and, and change those things. And if you look at it moving forward, you'll see that they'll have all these different things. So there's their lap pull down. Okay, each week it comes in and then each other day is here. So again, that's how quick it was to take somebody that ideally, you know, we would have liked to put them on a power plan, but you know, now they're being put on our long-term uppers. All right, so I know we're kind of running close here to time. So I just wanna cover one last thing and then uh, we'll kind of open it up um, for questions. Is that there's the argument of cookie cutter. You know, I, I don't believe in cookie cutter programs, you know, and it's just the anti-cookie thing. Well, I, I wanna tell everybody right now that, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible, cook. I'm a terrible chef. Um, you may just be good enough for the Pillsbury, you know, role. You may be, need something that's pre-made and that's fine. And again, too, I think especially now the technologies and softwares that are out there, I'd much rather see a seasoned, repeatable program. Again, whether it's a starting strength or it's a Texas or it's a, you know, who knows, there's a countless ones. If you're not confident in your ability to write from scratch, learn from it build it out. And again, too, typically what we tell everyone all the time. And again, this goes back to, you know, one of my mentors when I was at Salve, you know, Tom Blaney would always talk about, yeah, you don't need to be a five-star chef right off the bat, be a really good sous chef, learn how other people have made it and then build from there. And as time, as you get confident and as time, um, you know, you start learning about your, your training ability and what your students can do. That's a very, very safe way than just running from fad to fad to fad, um, trying to do something that's different. And I think we have a lot of that now with social media where, you know, just because it's different doesn't mean it's right. Charles Poliquin would quote all the time, just because you put your underwear on the outside of your pants doesn't make it correct. And so I think that if you look at some of the basic staples of training, you know, every program is pretty much going to go from light to heavy. There's going to be some sort of higher volume, you know, lower intensity teaching movements and trying to, you know, accumulate tissue in those specific paths. 
And then, you know, as you get closer to your season, there's going to be some sort of adaptation with bioenergetics and, you know, you're going to go from there. But I think that anytime we look at these templates, we have to have realistic expectations and, you know, it's going to work for some and degrees of not working for others. And, and I love this chart down here. And again, this is courtesy of Duncan French when he was at the NSCA, he gave a great presentation um, with the UFC. I thought this really nails it and is that you as a coach are going to have an athlete, you know, these are athlete A, B, C, D, E, F. They are all coming in at different levels. And again, you know, this guy F, we love F. He works so hard. He, he does everything. He has a lot of training improvement, but every sport has a demand. I mean, I, I love basketball, but I'm never going to the NBA. I'm too short. I'm not fast enough. And then on top of it, the other, you know, intangibles and all the other skill stuff, it, there's just such a gap. And especially from high school to college, college to professional, velocities increase, power demands increase, repeatability increases on top of skill and all the other things. So again, you know, the program for F is going to be a lot different than the program for B and, you know, player A. And I give credit to, you know, say a lot of the, the big time programs, just get people to show up, just get people to show up. We have some people that, you know, again, too, are just so genetically gifted and they're so far ahead, you know, in their sport um, that getting them to show up, having a good mindset. And so for this whole entire team, say this is a team right here, this whole entire team, every one of these people could be on a different plan. Or maybe you break it up into two different plans or you stratify it by adaptation. Say, hey, you know, after you progress a certain amount, we're going to switch you to a different one. And again, this is the high performance threshold. I always say to our coaches, this is the what you're going to need to be an all star. So usually your first team, second team, all team, there's some critical value. Uh, and then there's your elite level. So our guys that go to the NFL uh, at Yale all have very similar traits. Um, their elite traits um, that they have as prerequisites on top of all their skill sets. And again, what we're going to do for those guys is going to be completely different um, than some of our other ones. And this goes across all sports, both male and female. And again, the more you can drill down, the more you can break it up, the better you're going to be able to have um, training improvement. And again, too, on this guy might not improve at all, but you got him to show up. This person, you now made them equivalent. And again, too, this is really when people talk about you can't measure heart. Well, when you start getting into this phenomenon, this is you're making a player. You gave them the physical tools because all things being equal, B was not as gifted. B might, might end up being more productive than A because he had to work to get there. And again, these kind of visualizations are so simplistic and so simple, but you show this to a coach. It's pretty powerful when everybody above the dotted line, um, you know, is being successful. And so that's really, again, when I talked about the visualization is having simple visualizations that make the point of what your program is doing uh, is working or, you know, areas that you need to improve. So, and just with the final time here, I just kind of want to jump to any questions or anything like that. And again, too, uh, I can go, I can go on for hours about this stuff, but again, I hope that today you learned something or maybe, maybe not learn, but just had an aha, or maybe I'm going to go back and revisit some of my programs and think about it. Um, and just the combination, the possibilities are there to make, you know, your team the best it can be this spring. Cause I know we're all excited to get after it. Um, you know, holidays are great, but I think again, if you're a coach, uh, you always have an itch to get back in the weight room. Uh, and it's a reason why it's a, it's a passion and a profession, not just a job for many of us. So thank you so much for attending and uh, I appreciate it. So with that, Hewitt, any uh, other things? Yeah, folks. So um, if you see the Zoom webinar chat, feel free to use that chat to submit any questions here. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So that's, you know, ample time to, to get through some of this, uh, some of this stuff. And uh, Tom, I don't know, you, you have a little bit of content as well. If we're waiting for questions to trickle in here, you're welcome to kind of uh, maybe go on to case study four if you have that available, or if you want to, uh, you know, maybe go back and expand on any kind of slides here. Sure. Um, so I'll go back to here. So take a look at this um, way. If you're, if you're one of the coaches where you're like, wow, I'm drowning, you know, this is, this is really kind of a lot of overkill. I don't know where to start. Um, my recommendation is you take a look at, there's a book, uh, practical programming, starting strength. They usually go hand in hand. I think that's a really helpful start for a coach to understand that no matter what the sport is, really there's three kinds of athletes. There's athletes that are novices. So they're going to make day-to-day -day adaptations. And again, that's heavy focus and strength but it's also heavy focus in teaching. So again, I, uh, I challenge people when they talk about telling me about the percentages of an 11 year old athlete. Um, that's not the role of that 
that time of that athlete. They should be learning. They should be getting excited. Um, but having milestones where, again, to give your athletes wins, especially in the novice thing. If you get an athlete hooked to the process, that's far more important than just trying to chase goals uh, and outcomes. Next thing on the intermediates, again, this is where it can get a little bit tricky where, you know, these are weekly adaptations. And I think that, you know, if you're not programming correctly Monday through Thursday, that could directly impact Friday and you can overshoot it or undershoot it. And this is typically where either progress stalls or you get into uh, an injury type situation. And you certainly don't want that. And then lastly is advanced. And again, too, I don't, I don't really spend a ton of time on this um, because again, these are your multi-week, multi-month maybe even a year, multi-year type athletes, Olympic athletes, professional athletes. Um, those are so one-off in the bulk of the industry. I think really focusing your craft on the novice and intermediate, and whether it's games for the novices or intermediates, really solid coaching cues, that's really, um, really great. And, um, you know, you could certainly design plans that push, pull, rotate, stop, start, uh, those kind of things and, and get those in. Um, also conditioning plans, they're out there. So if you go and you think about, you know, okay, what am I trying to accomplish? Is this a buffering problem? Is this an aerobic problem? All those different things. Um, those are all certain, certainly things that you can think about. We'll typically program for football, um, in this for the summer. Uh, we do that typically during the month of December. And so we'll plan out, make multiple plans of attacks. And again, setting the, okay, if I achieve this, you know, how am I going to adjust? And then your default plans, recovery days, all those things are pretty straightforward. And again, I encourage people the more you plan out uh, and think about it, uh, the less stressful it is. There's nothing worse than being on the floor. Somebody comes up, I can't do this. What do I do? I don't know. I've, I've got a million and one things going on. Um, that's a tough place to be. And, and remember too, like, for instance, as I said earlier, um, programs can auto bump. So for instance, auto bump, we talk about bumping up your max. You can just set it that it say, okay, you know, we know that you know, three sets of, uh, three sets of five needs to achieve, uh, occur at 85%. Well, set your final set at 90 and know that if they hit five, uh, team builder will auto bump that for you. So especially some of your, um, accessory exercises, we talk about using sliding sets. So sliding set would be three sets of five. We're going to go 60, 60, 65. Okay. Well, when you hit 65, next time we're going to go 65, 65, 70 right? And all of those, you're just overshooting by three to 5%, uh, whatever the intended rep range is, and especially in the auxiliaries and in the additional movements, um, that seems to have worked really well at continually uh, developing, um, you know, progress on that. So again, don't forget your qualitative data. Um, that's just as important, especially earlier on. I know we had the high school coach ask the getting the culture right is so important. Um, everything else will kind of fall in place. And conversely, if, they, if they're not right or you don't feel comfortable as a coach, don't let them in there. And we say all the time, you know, whatever's in your team builder, that's what you're going to do that day. Um, because again, the last thing we want to have happen is an athlete gets hurt or something happens and we don't have documentation. We have to have the ability to make sure that every single workout, we can go back, call back and look and see what they did uh, and make adjustments both positively or negatively. So that's that. So again, I know we're right at time here. Any additional questions or are we good to go? Yeah, Tom, do you see the uh, the webinar chat panel by chance? We have a question from Peter. Um, it's a little bit longer. If you don't see that chat panel, I can um, I can relay the question to you. Yeah, I don't I don't have that. Okay. Um. So so Peter asks, um, what technologies, for example, sensor, GPS, readiness, AMS, um, have you implemented that has delivered the most value at Yale, and what data analytics approaches have helped you get some uh, aha moments in your practice? Yeah, great question. I mean, we, we've used a lot. So we, like I said before, uh, so we're very fortunate with the med school at Yale is pretty great. Um, so we've got access to a DEXA scanner. So a lot of our stuff, especially I speak for myself or football, there's certain muscle ranges and zones that we need to get our guys into. So you will, you will not be an NFL offensive lineman if you don't have at least 200 pounds of, of lean muscle. It's just a fact. Most kids will come in with 185 to 190. So when we write our programs, the DEX has been so helpful to say, okay, you know, I have you from January to March. What's the most amount of muscle I can put on? Um, and so we'll go back and, you know, rewrite programs. So currently right now in football, as I showed you those drill downs, we'll have 25 to 30 different plans running concurrently on the team. And those are all based off the insights we got off the DEXA to say, okay, our first and primary goal, especially with semis and bigs is to get that muscle number up. And there could be a whole host of factors. It could be that they're vitamin D deficient because we have um, 
access to do that at our health center. Um, it could also be that they didn't have technique and really bring up our mechanical loading and our mechanical loading programs into two different groups. And we don't know why, again, too, I think sometimes people talk about, well, you need to have the white paper. Well, you know, in 25 years, somebody's going to come back and tell me why this mattered. But we have guys that respond really well to classical bodybuilding. So your pyramids, your, you know, your tens, your twelves, you know, multiple angles. And we have other people that do really well with the metabolic kind of short rest protocol circuits. And so the DEX has been immensely powerful for us. Uh, also too, for body comp. So when we institute nutrition, I mean, it's pretty great when somebody can come in and, you know, they're completely changed. The scale hasn't moved at all, but you know, they're up 10 pounds of muscle and down 12 pounds of fat. That's a different person. And so that's been really rewarding. Um, data wise, um, honestly, I think the biggest thing for us is the look backs on the workouts. So we go through and we're very, very strict. Uh, we interset, auto-regulate. So my, you know, my hope and my goal, and we don't get it all the time, but is that our maxes and working sets are within 10 to 15 pounds of the intended max or even tighter. And sometimes it's spot on. Um, but that's the thing that when we audit programs daily, that's been really huge. And I think that, you know, the scientific questionnaire. So as I showed you before, um, you can input a, an exercise. You can just go ask the kids, how do you feel? And you don't have to go crazy with it. Like, you know, one through 10. Uh, my buddy, Dan Schaefer at Florida State used to say, you know, one, you know, I can run through walls, you know, 10, the walls are falling in on me, just simple stuff like that, see where their mind's at, and see how that grows. Um, so that's been very helpful. And then obviously, with our, um, our field hockey team as well, uh, coach Pam Stuper and coach TJ Bellinger, they've used uh, GPS extensively the last two years. And I think what's really interesting, and, and if anybody listening coaches field hockey, there's been a complete change in the bioenergetics of that sport. So when you talk about two halves versus four quarters, your repeatability at sprints and top velocities and IMAs um, has completely changed. So that whole, that whole conditioning approach is going to have to change because now they have to buffer the hydrogen ions and they're going to have to work on that strength. And that start stop is a lot different than that sustained um, kind of two to three minute type conditioning. So I think that would be uh, the, the big three. Um, but again, too, we learn so much from our programs. I think, you know, sometimes I almost feel like we're like a library. We'll say, hey, we're going to go pull all the offensive linemen programs from two, uh, 2017 and from 2018. And we're going to see what's different. And what did we do well? You know, what were the what were the RPEs? You know, did you go in and, you know, five by two at 80? okay, that's a pretty low RPE uh, lift. Did the guys really like that? Or, you know, for the ladies, you know, did they really enjoy five by three at 85? Cause it was a little higher intensity. Um, the look backs is probably our most powerful uh, data tool that we have right now. Um, but that being said, we are getting force plates. We are continuing to do blood. We're continuing to do um, stuff at DEXA. Um, so that those are kind of the things that get us most excited. Um, just a quick question about the, the look backs or the uh, retrospective audits. Um, obviously you have to have a tool, right. Or have an organized system, Excel, like if you're you know, using Excel, obviously you have to have a good system for indexing. If you're using team builders, easy enough. But when you do these retrospectives, are you pulling your team together and doing them collectively? Or are you delegating these retrospectives out to individual coaches? How do you kind of approach that from a management perspective? So the answer is yes to all of it. So typically, so for instance, for football, uh, we have a dedicated assistant, so he'll go through. So like, I know right now he's doing that. Um, we'll go through and we have very specific questions. It isn't just, Hey, let's go pull all the data and just kind of stare at it. We want to go. And, and I think, you know, there's some argument about this tonnage matter, this, that, well, you know, you can have a hundred pounds and lift it 10 times, or, you know, you can lift a thousand pounds once. Those are kind of completely different biological, um, you know, uh, adaptations. So a really easy one, just say, we're going to do three sets of 10 uh, on our squat and our workout's going to have eight stations. Okay. So now you do the math, you add it up. And as long as your reps are locked and fixed, you can go and look at tonnage. So we know for say uh, a short rest protocol, you should have 35,000 to up to 50,000 pounds moved, you know, work rates of like 50 to 60,000 pounds per hour. We know that if we're hitting that target and we see a growth of 30% in the course of four weeks, that's a good plan. And so, and it's repeatable. We've done it with multiple teams throughout years. We'll then assign a coach and say, Hey, go pull, go pull so-and-so. He had a really great season or go pull uh, her number. She, she got all American this year. What, what were some of the things, you know, what were some of the context? Cause again, sometimes people say, well, this workout doesn't work. Well, typically it means it didn't work for you or you didn't work for it but there's a set of predetermined things. The easy way to think about it is that you can do all the plyo programs you want, but if you don't squat at least one and a half times your body weight, it's far less effective. So again, maybe I'm gonna build up my strength. 
when I get to one and a half to two, I'm going to then switch over. I'm going to add plows or I'm going to do my Olympics. Uh, and there's a Ford on, uh, focus on rated force development, but that could be an individual coach. Uh, when we do our May, when we do our May time or in, um, in what was it uh, the week after harvard uh that monday so saturday's the game sunday's the banquet monday we get in at 8 a.m and we roll for 12 hours and as an entire staff we'll sit down and as hewitt mentioned you can export the raw data um and we throw it into excel we've got some guys that are really gifted uh, at that and we look at it and then we have really critical conversations because even though we're looking at the raw data the most important thing is the comments so we we really encourage our athletes to include comments hey this felt terrible this made me feel great. And, you know, I, I say all the time, we have, I have plans that if I showed you guys, you'd be like, wow, that doesn't look anything special. But if your captain all American says it makes him feel awesome and he can go score, you know, four or five goals a game, we're going to roll with that. Right. We don't need to overthink that. I don't, I don't need a white paper to tell me if my top player, male or female loves that we, we are going to roll with that on the Thursday before the weekend. Um, but we wouldn't know if we didn't look at the comments. So I think, surprisingly people are all searching for these new sensors and data to look for that look back uh, either individually for a specific question or as a team retrospectively you can learn so much uh, and that's really really helped us every time we do a deep dive we pick a team say it's going to be tennis say it's going to be lacrosse basketball we learn a lot as a group and that's where i told you I, i'm you know i'm a percentage of my staff they they are phenomenal and they you know go down so many rabbit holes on a daily basis sometimes it's hard for me to pull them back out but uh you know, it's the culture that we have is that that optimal workouts out there and maybe we hit it, maybe we didn't, but we have to be searching for it anyway, if that makes sense. So another great question. Yeah, that is, uh, um, that, that does make sense. Like the, the, the qualitative feedback from athletes, um, you know, after doing a lot of these calls with coaches for, for many, many years now, um, I, I get, sometimes I get the impression that, you know, opening up the channel for qualitative feedback is not the most desired thing for coaches that they might feel like this, you know, opens up uh, more noise or, you know, it might be something that, you know, the program's the program. I don't necessarily need the feedback loop from athletes on it. Uh, but you're kind of turning that idea upside down on top of his head saying that it, it couldn't be more important. Yeah. And I think, you know, you need to address that. Like I, I hear, I hear the, 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 the pain and okay, well, I don't want to open it up and the kids are giving their opinion and we're changing the workout every 10 seconds. But say again, if it's five by two at 80, five by three at 80, five by three at 85, whatever the rep scheme is you choose, you know, if the kid writes back, you know, I feel terrible, I feel terrible. Well, if we go and ask them and we say, you know, hey, why did you feel terrible? You know, are you, are you being soft? Or you know what, maybe you've got something going on at home. I mean, again, I think we forget that, you know, maximally in college, you're training, maybe eight hours, maybe it's a little bit more sport coaches have some more, but like, there's 168 hours in the week. You know, I think that if you don't listen to your athletes, and again, not that you're going to change everything all the time, but if you don't have kind of context of what's going on in their life, I don't know how you can write an effective plan. Because remember, the plan's for them, not for you. And so you need to have that. And as your culture gets better, and kind of what we've seen now with some of our teams at Yale is we're having to pull the reins back. You know, I tell the guy all the time, if I have to motivate you to lift today, then, you know, get, get out. You got to love lifting. You got to love lifting not only for you, but love lifting for your teammates around you. And Duncan French did a great, um, you know, study on the, the brain and looking at the, the hormone response that there's a reason why the, the, the gains culture is a very real thing. If you go in and you're hyped up and you bring energy, you give energy to other people. That's why it's so important. So again, too, not that I need a novel or a dissertation, dissertation, but I would hope that my juniors and senior comments should be awesome, crushed it, can't wait to do more. You know, my freshman might be, I'm really nervous. I didn't want to ask for help because remember, it's, you know, especially too in, a, in an alpha male culture, they don't want to show weakness, but it's not, not scary to throw a quick comment to the coach. And I'll say, hey, you know, I read through the comments. I noticed you said you were a little nervous. Why don't you come in at Saturday school and let's go work on some technique stuff. It's all cool, right? And that might be the most important thing you do in the kid's career is develop your relationship with, uh, with them to understand that they might be a gifted athlete. They're just a bad lifter. And that's fine. But, you know, whatever vehicle you can do to, to get to that, that's the most important thing, if that makes sense. So you're saying, you, you know, like uh, in addition to the importance of negative feedback, conversely, positive feedback reinforces your programming as well. Yeah. I mean, we joke all the time is that, you know, with the Ivy League, these kids don't have a lot of time, but for some reason they all keep hanging out. You know, we'll have a lift from four to five and they want to hang out and do extra. They want to hang out and, you know, talk to us. And again, your strength staff culture should be one of that, you know, you're inspiring them. It shouldn't be that, you know, they're, they're punching in and punching out. I don't think that's effective, especially for us. You know, the Ivy League doesn't have scholarships. So every athlete that plays on a team, you know, could walk away at any moment. 
And so when you think about an entire football team or a lacrosse team or a baseball team, there's got to be something that drives them. And that has to be their culture and specifically their relationships with each other. And that's something we actively work on. And we could do a whole talk about that as well. But you want them to be pushing each other. And it's an exciting because we tell them all the time, you're going to blink and your college career is over. So when you come in here, you have to enjoy the process. You have to enjoy grinding with each other, sharing those moments and those memories, because there's a lot more off-season training than there is actual games. Any sport has a few games a season. We've yeah. got hundreds and hundreds of workouts. So, you know, and, and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, when I got here, it wasn't, you know, what it is now. But, you know, I'm excited to see that, you know, when our guys, hey, can we come in early? Hey, can I come in and do more? You know, our, our women's programs, look at just the participation in the summer has skyrocketed the number of female athletes we had. It's awesome. You know, Saturday school, you know, used to be just football. And now you walk in, you might have 20 different teams. You might have a heavyweight, you know, crew guy next to, you know, a field hockey player next to a softball player next to a soccer player next to a basketball player. And it's awesome. And that's again, too, if you're, if you're a coach, hopefully you're doing it because you love it. And uh, you know, there's nothing more exciting for you than seeing your athletes get better. And everybody got into this to help people. I think that's, you know, I haven't met, all of you, but you know, I think if you're listening to this, you love helping people and we're just putting more tools in your toolbox to be able to do that. And it's exciting. I get, I still get excited to this day to see the first time someone power cleans 315 or the first time they bench 135, you know, it's exciting. And that's what motivates you and uh, your athletes feed off that as well. But um, you know, certainly a technology that's in their phone on the mobile app, or we we're fortunate enough to have iPads at every rack, shoot me a quick note. And then we just run the notes at the end of the night and it could be really quick or it could be a more in-depth conversation, but just, it's more touch points. And I think, especially today, the more you have of those, the better. Yeah. So, um, man, that was really good. I, I'm going to go ahead and get us started on wrapping up here. Um, look folks, if you listen to this webinar and, um, you have some feedback for me, please go ahead and just say so in the chat, you know, just, just say whether you liked it. Was it, was, was it good? Was it bad? scale one to five, one to 10, I, I don't care. Um, I'm just genuinely interested in what you guys thought about this content and this presentation. Uh, Tom wants to hear from you as well. Tom's not a social media guy. <laughs> I know that he's anti, are you anti social media? I am, yeah, I'm not, not a big social media guy. Just blocking out the noise, right? Staying focused on the job. Um, but of course, if you, you know, you, you guys know the drill. If you um, just Google Tom's name and, and Yale, you'll find his uh, email, his school email, um, or Tom, you can maybe share another way people can get in touch. Um, but please reach out. Tom's been really good at, at being an open book for any of my friends and customers here at Team Builder, and I'm sure he will be for you as well. So I want to encourage anyone to, to reach out. Um, so yeah, any last things you want to say, Tom, before we wrap up? No, that's it. I just hope it, I hope it, uh, you know, I hope it was something was helpful today. And again, too, as, as you had pointed out, I, I'm always learning. And again, too, I think the, uh, the intercollaboration of people that are actually in the trenches, uh, you know, he joked about it, but he, it's true is that, you know, I tend to focus less on social media and, and more focus on having people come visit Yale. I mean, you're all welcome to come visit, um, you know, love talking to people, talking shop, because again, too, day in and day out in the trenches, you know, people around you make you better. So, and again, I'm excited to learn from any of you guys that are on here, uh, just the ways that we can do better. Cause we're always chasing, um, that kind of optimal plan and trying to get better as coaches. And then also to, uh, the plans for our athletes. So thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Awesome. This is what it's about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.